you. Thank you very much, Federico, for your introduction. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in, in Russia, and I was visiting your hospital, well, the hospital yesterday, and was impressed by your uh, huge activity in spite that it was Friday. And, and I'm very happy and enjoying very much this, this trip here. Well, uh, the aim of my presentation is to convince you that the EEG is easier than it seems, it looks like, and that uh, it's very nice to use it. It gives you a lot of information, more than you imagine, and as I will try to convince you by the end of the lecture, it's almost mandatory to use it in all our patients. I have no conflict of interest regarding this lecture. And what is EEG? Well, you already know. You know, all of you know what it is. This is just the way we are collecting the local field potentials produced by the huge number of parallel pyramidal neurons in the cortex. If we put an electrode in the skull, we just get this electrical information and we, we are able to analyze it. It was in 1937 when the first uh, experiments demonstrated that there was a relationship between the effects of the anesthesia and the changes in the electrical activity in the cortex. It was clear to observe that when the anesthesia was getting deeper, the electrical fields changed in a very complicated uh, way. And as it looked like that complicated, it was abandoned for many years by the anesthesiologist. You know, it was too, too complicated to have so many electrodes in the, in the head and strange waves moving around, not easy to be interpreted. But I will convince you, as some other uh, papers have already demonstrated, that it's just a matter of a few minutes, just maybe half an hour studying a bit of EEG, and it will be easier to interpret most of the things you can see in the operating room. Well, what is an EEG? It's just waves. No? You know, waves are described just by its frequency and by its amplitude. So in the brain, we have this different kind of waves. We have the very slow and delta wave, which is our wave that are moving one to four cycles per minute, well, four seconds, sorry. And you can count them. Then a bit more quick are the theta waves, the alpha waves from 8 to 12 uh, hertz, as waves per, per second, then the beta waves, and then the gamma waves from 24 to 48. It's easy to remember, huh? 1 to 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, 12 to 24, and 24 to above. I want to put your attention in two main waves. The alpha waves, those going from 8 to 12 hertz, uh, are very important because it, during anesthesia, it's been clear, demonstrated that this is the wake patient. We have most of our alpha waves in the occipital area, and as we come unconscious and during the anesthesia, the alpha wave move forward, and you can uh, you can uh, collect them in the frontal lobe. How can we detect that those alpha wa alpha waves? Well, it's very easy. When you see the EEG, this is the quickest a wave that you can count. No? In a second, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, you cannot count the beta wave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, 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 you cannot count that. No. So when you see that you're able to count the waves uh, in the EEG, this is alpha waves, easy to, to see. And then the delta waves. Delta waves have been associated with the depth of anesthesia. Uh, and you're easy to see, it's like, Waves in the sea, no, you can count them easily, one, two, three, four in, in a second. No? And very often uh, that are the most amplitude waves in the, in the EEG. An example, this is an EEG recorded during a general anesthesia, and you can easily see here the delta waves, this is one second, no? the delta wave, and the alpha spindles, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, you can count them, huh? and less than 12 per second, then you have alpha waves. Yeah? Alpha waves in the mount of the delta wave. Easy to see, isn't it? If you anesthesia go deeper, you also can see this in the register. You all know what it is. That's 
are the well-known bar suppression waves. Now you can see the part of a flat EEG activity, the suppressed ac activity, together with this burst activity. Uh, suppressed burst, suppressed burst. Now, the deepest the anesthesia is, the longest the suppressed uh, part of the EEG goes. Let's try to analyze a bit more this way. We have this zoom of these delta alpha beta waves in the EEG, but we are able to decompose this way no? in the different uh, frequencies. For example, in this case, this rho EEG can be decomposed in this delta wave and also in these alpha waves. And we can show that as a spectrum. In the spectrum, you have here the frequency, so that would be the slow waves, that would be the alpha waves. You can see the power, uh, the highest, the, the column, the biggest, the power of the waves. No? So mainly it's delta and alpha. That would be the typical power of one uh, asleep patient. If we analyze, sorry, if we analyze the whole spectrum, we are able to check in which part most of the energy is put. So we put a line where the 95% of the energy is gone, and this is what we'll call the spectral edge frequency 95. This was, in fact, uh, a method using in the old devices, and I should say last century already, in the old devices monitoring the EEG. When we were looking at this uh, CEF here to check how was the depth of the anesthesia in those patients. If we put this spectrum one beside the other, this is one second, second, third, four seconds, no? we can have this compressed spectral array that you, you can see, you probably have seen in several of the slides, and those are the old BIS monitors when, when, before Medtronic appears, and you can see that this compressed spectral array here that was giving us a more uh, detail of how was the EEG going on. Now, nowadays, we can put colors to things, no? So if we put that in colors and we change the high energy to red colors and the low energy to blue colors, we can see this spectrum moving the time, no? and we can even put that in two dimensions, right? You can see two dimensions. And if you turn it 99 degrees, you have the spectrum. Now the time is here, and the power is here, so you can have the delta wave here, the theta wave here, the alpha wave here, the beta, and the gamma. Easy to see. No? Low frequency, high frequency, beginning, the end of the procedure. And you have everything together in the same slide. The rho EG, the composed, the spectral array, the CEF, the compressed spectral array, and the density spectral array, all put together, probably easy to to understand. But let's see what this spectrogram is telling us. Now, that would be a very typical spectrogram of propofol anesthesia. At the beginning, we have energy all over the spectrum. You have energy here in the gamma wave, alpha wave, theta, everywhere, and a lot of in the delta wave. This patient is awake with a lot of artifacts in the spectrum. Once we give bolus of propofol to the patient, then suddenly disappear all the high frequency waves, and most of the waves are just here in the delta. You can see in the rho EG, as this, you have these waves, slow waves moving around the EG. That will be dominant delta and its uh, spectrogram. Just some time later, the alpha wave appears. Uh, and you see here the delta, and the alpha, yeah, about the 10 hertz. And you can see here, once again, the slow waves uh, together with the alpha spindles here. See, alpha spindles here. And you can count them. Yeah? One, two, three, four, five. Anesthesia goes, the patient starts to recover, and then you can already once again see the activity in the higher frequency uh, rates. What happens if we go too deep into anesthesia? Then we go into the bar suppression. And here you can see the bar suppression, how it looks like in the spectrogram. is a bar that almost reaches the bottom, so there is no activity even in the slow uh, waves, eh? the bar suppression here. 
the patient recover from anesthesia, if the anesthesia is getting swallowed, then you increase the alpha to the low beta uh, waves. And you will tell me what is it. No? If I tell you that these main waves here, you see is a patient 20 to 20, is 15 to 20 is more than alpha, that would be low beta, so the patient is just sedated. It's not anesthetized. You cannot be sure that the patient is anesthetized with this uh, uh, spectrogram here. Another two examples, easy to see. The patient was slept, he's sleeping here. Then the depth of anesthesia reduced. You can see this is the white line is the CEF. The CEF increased, the alpha disappeared. The patient was waking up. We increased the anesthesia, so the CEF went down the alpha wa waves appear again, and the patient was still sleeping. And during the recovery of anesthesia, both sides, whoop, CEF goes up, alpha disappear, and delta disappear, and increase activity in the higher frequency rates. Easy, easy to see. And the magic of this thing, the most interesting thing, is that we have been able to fit what we know in the neurophysiological uh, studies together with the spectrum and we've been able to say how the the neurophysiological change due to the effects of the propofol can be registered we, we know we are able to understand how this uh, neuron activity is translating into the EEG of course this is similar but not exactly the same with other anesthetics for example that would be with an alt anesthetics the with low concentration, it looks like very similar to the propofol, but if you increase the MAC, then you have this effect here. You know? This is the appearance of theta waves here, what we call the filling effect. So there is something that fills between the alpha and the delta. And this is very typical from uh, deep anesthesia in civil foreign. If you change your drug, of course, the drug acts in another way. So the reflection of its section into the brain, it's also different. So for example, with dexmedetomidine, you have these alpha spindles, but they are not continuously here. And if you go deeper, then the alpha spindles disappear and you have those uh, delta uh, energy here. Uh, it's resembling very much to the effect of the sleep in our EEG. Ketamine is also very different. You already know that ketamine acts in another way different to the uh, typical GABA, uh, GABAergic uh, drugs. And in the ketamine, you can see that the gamma oscillation is still there, but there is no alpha activity and very low delta activity. Uh, very typical from the ketamine. And we are able to know why is this happening in the, in the EEG. So the, the, the nice thing of this spectrogram is that different aesthetics act in a different way. We have different electroencephalogram signatures, and those are because the anesthetics act in a different way. They modify the neural activity in a different way, so we can show it in the EEG too. Of course, it is quite a lot more complicated if we put a lot of anesthetics all together than the interpretation of these signals is really, really a bit more confusing, and you need to be a bit more expert on, on that. Another interesting point is that the EEG is modifying by age. Uh, so you see how the alpha waves are here in a three-year-old patient, and how they go down and disappear when the patient is much older. Uh, so this is an important thing to consider when we're going to anesthetize our patients when they are old. Uh, and it affects to the alpha waves, both in cellophane or prolophal anesthesia, for example, but also in the risk of going into birth suppression. The older you are, the more risk to go into birth suppression in general anesthesia. Uh, this is the years and the increased rate of birth suppression. That would be interesting to, to see, to analyze later. After analyzing the raw curves uh, about 20, 25 years ago, a lot of uh, indexes to make easy the understand of EEG appear in the market. You probably know very many of them. The most well known is the BIS index. Now it's in terms of Medtronic. And they have a proprietary algorithm which is very complex and it's a bit hidden so we don't know exactly how it works. 
and did give you also the well-known base value for all of you. I'm not going to go into this, but also other uh, data, such so as the suppression ratio, the CEF95, the quality signal, the EMG, so to make it easier to interpret. It. But remember, when you look into the base value, never forget to go on with the waves by your side. No? Just do not uh, lose your attention to, to that. You can see two examples, probably you know all of the bees. Here, this is a bees of an awake person. You can see a lot of waves here. You cannot count them. These uh, waves here, you will see later what they are. And this is the typical bees of a too deep anesthetized patient. Well, you can see the delta waves is seen here. And the alpha waves, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, easy to count them. Hmm? And you can see also that does the, the bore suppression rate you cannot see here, but there is a, a task of, of bore suppression. But bees, the number, has already recognized artifacts. Even the same enterprise knows that it's happening. It is not just that the, image, the EMG is uh, altering the, the register of the waves, but also medical devices, clinical conditions, uh, abnormal EEG uh, activities, but also many, much more important, different anesthetics that we're commonly using do not translate into a BIS number change uh, in our practice. So we cannot rely on the BIS number whenever we are out of the propofol or the civil uh, anesthesia. For example, this is an example of our uh, experience that was a patient just entering the operating room the patient was not even still premedicated, and the patient was blinking. And this was interpreted by the machine as delta wave, and the base number was 47. As soon as the patient received one milligram of midazolam, it stopped blinking, and the base increased to 89. So you have to be careful interpreting just the number. And this is another example. You already are easy to, to see that those are Delta waves, very easy. Eh? And from time to time, one, two, three, four, five, the alpha waves. But then it's, the bees is quite high comparing to the CEF. The bees is not reflecting the real depth of anesthesia. So you have to be aware when you read the number. You also have to look for the wave to make sure that the number is giving you the right information. That is so important that even the enterprise tells you that for the safe clinical use of these monitors, a clear mental picture of the expected raw electroencephalogram patterns, as well as the knowledge of the common EEG artifacts is absolutely necessary. It is not me that I'm saying are the same producers of the machine. So it is important you are able to analyze, to read what the EEG is showing you. There are other uh, indexes that you probably already know. The set line with the Maximo company that is showing similar uh, patterns. Instead of Bs, they call it PSC value, and you have also the, the spectrogram here to analyze, also the artifacts, the SEF, to make it easy to, to see. They also have artifacts in, another, in the similar way to the, to the Bs monitor. No, don't many changes to that. Other uh, indexes as the entropy, which uh, consider the analysis of the EG in a different way, but by the end it gives you similar numbers, maybe not that much altered by the EMG, but also, uh, also very useful. And some other uh, design indexes. I just want to point these to the app, which are uh, designed in Barcelona as the football team. And uh, we are not using them uh, really very often in the routine. And what are the indications? I'm moving to another part of my lecture. What are the indications for the EEG? Well, if you want to analyze the raw EEG, probably it's very uh, useful when you're doing temporary clip or when you're doing carotid and arterectomies. Also for the cerebral protection in the ICU, we will have a lecture about the use of EEG in the, in the ICU or for coma assessment or seizures and so on. But for these uh, indications, you probably need a neurologist or neurophysiologist to interpret long and um, full EEG uh, signals. But for us, what is important for us? Uh, what, how can we learn to use the EEG? Well, mainly for the depth of anesthesia evaluation. This is going to be a full lecture on that, so I'm not going to go deep into this. But also for other indications. Uh, for example, 
to check, to analyze the presence of cerebral ischemia. We know, as I said before, that the EEG is modified by the metabolic rate of the brain. We know, as for example, anesthesia changes the metabolic brain, um, rate of the brain, so it alters the EEG, but also the changes in the temperature, the changes in the neurological disease, the changes in the metabolic status, and also the changes in ischemia. You see, as the blood flow goes down, then this goes down, and the activity is reduced. And we can see nice examples. For example, this is cardiac surgery, a patient that was weaning from the cardiovascular bypass. And here you see how the uh, cerebral uh, perfusion goes down at the same time that this uh, bar suppression appears in the AG. So the patient was not able to go out of the weaning without uh, impairing their cerebral uh, flow. So the AG activity was going down. Some other studies also shown this correlation. For example, these two patients in cardiac arrest, you could see how the birth suppression increased and the visco values went down and it recovered to normality when the heart function recovers. So there is a clear, interesting relation between ischemia and the electrical activity, so it can be also useful to detect these uh, changes. Seizures detection has also been uh, shown in several papers with uh, with the use of these or of other uh, indexes. You, know? For, uh, you have several descriptions in papers of patients who were in the operating room and the seizures were detected by changes, sudden changes in the EEG. In a very recent study of our own team, uh, we've seen that very few seizures activity are detected by the, by the bees. Just when you have a non-convulsive status, you're able to detect these changes in the, in the activity, but not when you have any other type of seizures that are not generalized and affecting those. So probably do not expect to find the seizures uh, in your bees just uh, by having them anesthetized. And then the delirium already has been shown that there is a clear relation between the appearance of delirium and death of anesthesia. Those are two meta-analyses showing with um, very nice papers already published that if you have deep anesthesia, you increase much the risk of delirium in the post-operative period. And it is not just the death of anesthesia, it's not the low vis, but also if you have a lot of bar suppression, then the risk of having a severe delirium in the post-operative period is very high. Due to this, many institutions, many societies recommend us to monitor the EEG, monitor the indexes, whichever the, the machine you are using, to reduce the chance of the patient to have delirium in the postoperative period, especially of those patients with high risk, as we saw at the beginning. Older patients with high risk of uh, getting into deep anesthesia should be mandatory monitorized to, re to reduce the the potentiality of, of delirium. And also, as Professor Bilota has said, mortality. The most important outcome in our patient has been associated with depth of anesthesia. After the phase and the first papers of Terry Monk, with this association, several other papers have demonstrated that low Vs and low pressure together are risk factor for mortality in the patient. It is not that they are producing mortality, but associated. So we have to make the possible to uh, avoid this to, to happen. So, for example, there's all the UK guidelines very published recently where this kind of monitors should be used in general anesthesia whenever we have a high risk patient of adverse outcomes, delirium, mortality, etc. But to conclude, just making sense of the evidence, in spite of the limitations of the current quantitative indices, you know how to interpret the EEG, and it is clear that we have to use them to reduce the chances of uh, bad outcomes in, in our patients. And probably, I'm sure, and I'm using it routinely, I'm sure that we all will be using routinely these uh, devices uh, in the future. For you who are interested in uh, increase your uh, knowledge, please visit those uh, web pages. Are really, really, really very, very educative, and and very easy to just take the pictures and remember that. At very, very nice and very interesting to 
to read. Thank you very much for your attention. It's possible. Да, вопрос, пожалуйста. Dr. Valero, thank you for your excellent speech. Uh, my question is related with the ECG. I want to know if um, external stimulus, for example, noise in the operating room can affect the measurement of the ECG, in which by this external stimulus, the ECG can show up high frequency uh, waves in uh, adequately uh, depth of anesthesia. So that can lead to a misinterpretation of the ECG. These questions come from that I recently have read that this situation can happen in the, in the interpretation of the bees when um, noise or in the operating room can affect the measurement. So you can have values over 65, for example, 75, 80, uh, that are close to the awakening of the patient but really the patient is in an adequate state of anesthesia, so it's in a death plane. So that, that's my question. Thank you. You, you mean EEG, no ECG, no? EEG. Yeah, so. okay, yeah. Because ECG also have artifacts on EEG. Right? You know, uh, you, when you have bar suppression, you can easily see the ECG uh, uh, spikes in the EEG. Right? So of course, no? every, every noise in the operating room affects the EEG and so the indexes. No. Uh, it's very easy to see when the surgeons are using the cautery, the, the artifacts are very clear, and many other devices can alter. For example, the monitor of the depth of blockage, of neuromuscular blockage, or the, um, the stimulus of the bulk potentials, no. and particularly the own patient uh, noise. No? I'm sure that most of you are using uh, general anesthesia with muscle relaxants in many neurosurgical operations because they need to be monitored for the bulk potential, for example, and you can have a lot of noise in the EMG and it's, effect, it's affecting quite much the indexes. In these cases, most of these cases, if you pay attention to the raw EEG, you easily identify that this is an artifact. No, because you can see the artifact in the EEG and you can see the, the waves below the artifacts. So it's easy to interpret or much easier to interpret than just by the BIS number or the index number, whatever you're using, that this is an artifact and that you, you have to be aware that your patient is not awakening. It's just that you have an artifact. That's why I really encourage you to put the raw EG in larger screen in your monitor no? uh, to, to see it better or add it to just the index that you can see. Please. Спасибо за вашу презентацию. По вашему мнению, существует ли связь... Wait, 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 wait a second. Okay, one, do it. А существует ли, по вашему мнению, связь между перфузией мозга и частотой ЭЭГ? Sure it is, sure it is. And uh, it's something that you have to be aware of that. No? Uh, and you can, you, you can even use it uh, specifically to that. It's very uh, typical. I don't know if you're monitoring uh, EEG on a bulk potential during aneurysm clipping. We are doing it in, in our operating room and when the surgeon is going to do a temporary clipping, we are controlling the EEG, not, not myself, but the neurophysiologist. And it's a way to see if uh, the temporary clippings have to be released because the patient is getting ischemic. So it, in fact, since we're using it, we stop using the jugular bulb uh, saturation to monitor this. So the, the relationship between cerebral perfusion and EEG is immediate. Uh, it's just after the clipping, if the clipping is not well done, EEG goes down. So it's really, really very uh, fixed, very connected, the cerebral perfusion and the changes in the EEG. Um, 
thank you for your uh, lecture. I have more practical question. Uh, what kind of electrodes and how many channels uh, do you recommend for raw EEG recording in uh, OR? Sorry, can you repeat uh, again? In sir? operation room. What kind of electrodes, uh, disc electrodes or needles? Uh, clear? Yeah. Uh, if the neurophysiologist is doing the EEG for this, for example, aneurysm clipping, they are using several electrodes uh, in the head. It's not exactly a regular EEG, and they are using normal electrodes or a <coughs> kind of coil. But, but this is not in the many of the cases we're using this. For our anesthetist EEG analysis, you can use the BIS monitor or the set line monitor. It's more than enough for our regular practice. I do not want or think that we are able to analyze a full row EEG with uh, 12 uh, waves at the same time. No, we cannot do that. We have many other things to do. But uh, for the simple analysis of the row EEG that you have in your BS monitor or your set line monitor with the simple stick in the front, it's uh, enough, it's more than enough to get much more information than the one you get from the BIS number. Здравствуйте. Два вопроса. Первый. При каком анестетике нельзя применять без мониторирования? И второй вопрос. Как найти золотую середину для всех комфортную? Это избыточная глубина анестезии, низкое артериальное давление и среднее, соответственно. И желанием хирургической бригады получить э, менее кровоточащую рану, в частности, например, при ортопедических операциях. Спасибо. Thank you. Um, well, drugs, you can use all the drugs. No? I mean, you just have to know what you're going to see in the, in the bees. No? The drugs that correlate easier with the bees are mainly propofol and uh, inhalatory anesthetics. Those are the ones that correlate the best. If you're using ketamine, dexmedetomidine, etomidate, you cannot rely on this number because this number is not giving you the information that you want. But you can see how the raw EEG is changing. Uh, and you can see how it correlates the activity of the EEG to the drug you have been used. So if you want to make sure that the bees is giving you right ten, the most possible right number, you have to use inhalation anesthesia, not halotane. I'm using halotane, but not halotane, but sevoflurin, isoflurin, and propofol, the most uh, common drugs. Which is the EG we want to see? Well, if you see delta waves with alpha spindles, oh, it was run if you see but if you use this here in the EEG for example you see these delta waves with alpha spindles huh? another example huh? delta wave alpha spindles Another example, delta wave. This is, these are more than alpha. These are probably beta. So the base value is a bit high, you see. And let me go to the beginning. Here. Huh? You can see here huh? the delta with the alpha spindles, delta with the alpha spindles, you are sure that the patient is anesthetized and in the best uh, range of anesthesia. You probably will not find this in all your patients hmm? because the, uh, particularly in the old patients, you can lose quite a lot of alpha spindles here and the patient is well anesthetized too. No? But 
if in a regular patient you are losing the alpha wave because the alpha is increasing or because the alpha is disappearing, you are probably going to too uh, swallow or too deep anesthesia. So which is your uh, aim? To get alpha, alpha, and delta, and delta. Спасибо. Ну, да, сейчас. Э, считается, что э, бис не работает при кетамине и ксеноне. Но вот наш опыт свидетельствует о том, что при ксеноновой анестезии вполне информативен. Те же значения. Спасибо. Спасибо, Рикард. Спасибо большое.